This is mine? Yes. Oh, thanks. Okay, so, um, well, this is the NF Tables workshop. Uh, my name is Pablo, and uh, we are going to discuss, um, um, basically expose some um, changes that we have made on the NF filter subsystem in the, since the last NFDEP uh, conference, and also we are going to spend some time on on uh, talking on, on the improvements that we have performed on, on the NF Tables um, infrastructure. So, um, we are going, to, we are going to, to start with uh, Laura. Laura, she's been, she's been a, a outreach, uh, she's been working on, on a filter in the frame of that outreach program, and she's been improving the um, load balancing infrastructure for NF tables, basically with two new expressions that are uh, the number generation and, and the, hash, um, the, the hash expression. And then um, I will let Florian discuss some ongoing work on, on the new uh, FIP expression. And I, I, I will then add the, the discussions and presentations with um, some ideas um, that I have also considered interesting to discuss. So, um, Laura, would you like to? So, how does this work? Hello? Okay, um, this is the, the second part of um, the load balancing with NF tables that we presented in the NetDev 1.1 in Seville. Uh, we presented um, a prototype, so here we are going to see uh, some development evolution that we made, uh, the review of some use cases that we presented, uh, some benchmarks um, in order to see in what state is uh, this development and some work to do. So, regarding the development evolution that uh, we have been working on, um, we included two main expressions in NF tables. Uh, a number generator uh, which supports two modes, incremental, incremental and random and uh, provides the ability to scale values and add an offset. Uh, in addition, the hash expression, um, it's able to hash any selector concatenation, uh, in, and currently it's only one mode uh, which uh, supports Jenkins hash. Uh, some examples uh, regarding the uh, number generator expression, uh, which is based on uh, the IP table extensions uh, statistics. Um, the incremental counter is used to, to generate a round robin scheduler. Uh, for example, here uh, we are going to match a destination address with TCP destination port. And we are going to apply a DNAT to um, incremental modulus 2 for two indexes uh, that are stored in a map. Uh, the, the values are the destination addresses that uh, are going to be uh, substituted to the, in the, into the DNAT. Also, this uh, expression uh, is, uh, it could be able to to be used uh, in order to generate series of, of numbers, for example, to mark um, uh, packets, for example, marking packets. So we could generate uh, a series of numbers adding an offset. In the random uh, generation, uh, it could be used for weight scheduler. And uh, as an example, we could match a destination address and a destination port uh, and apply a DNA to a random modulus 2, which will be the two indexes of the map. Also, it could be used to generate a series of numbers. For example, if we apply an offset of 100, 
uh, we could uh, generate a series between 100 and 102. In regards to the hash expression, um, we could be used, uh, it could be used for persistence. So if we match a destination IP address and a desti destination TCP port, we could apply a DNAT uh, with a hashing function using the source address modulus 2. So uh, for the same source address, we'll be used uh, one backend or another. The same thing here, we could use uh, jhash to uh, mark packets in regards to the source address and apply even a seed or an offset in order to generate a series of hashing. Uh, in order to use these uh, new features, uh, we will need a new kernel uh, greater than 480RC4 with branch uh, NF, uh, next. Uh, the library NFTNL uh, greater than 106 and a packet of NF tables greater than 0 0.7, uh, although it's not released yet. So we are going to review some use cases. Uh, this is the definitive syntax. For example, for a SNAT topology, uh, we need, uh, here we have a four steps um, packet, packet uh, path. So in this case, the, the LV uh, needs to change the source IP address and destination IP address to the backend. So we will need to uh, create a table with two chains, pre-routing and post-routing. Um, uh, just one rule to create uh, a match uh, from destination address, a certain destination address and destination port, and apply uh, a DNAT um, function to uh, an incremental modulus three, because we have three backends. It will generate a random scheduler uh, with the map of three IP addresses. It's needed for this topology to uh, include a masquerade to be um, not transparent. In the use case for destination mass, NAT is uh, quite similar, but in this case uh, we will have uh, four steps for uh, the complete the path for a packet. Uh, in this case, we have to change the destination IP address uh, and the backend needs to have the load balancer IP as a gateway. So it's quite similar to the, to the previous uh, use case. Uh, in this case, we have used the random function to create, for example, a weight scheduler but here we are, uh, we are going to avoid the masquerade, but it's needed to create a, the chain post-routing. Uh, this is a use case that uh, we didn't um, take uh, into consideration in the, in the last talk, uh, but now that we have support in, in FA tables uh, from Ingress, uh, we could um, make an, uh, an approach for direct server return. In direct server return, uh, we have three steps to complete the, the packet path, and the load balancer needs to change the source MAC address and destination MAC address. So uh, it's, uh, it's sufficient to create a, a chain with the hook ingress, the device of the load balancer, and uh, to create just one uh, rule that uh, matches a destination address and a destination port. In this case, will be UDP because um, this um, this use case is for non-connection oriented. We have to change the source address, uh, source uh, MAC address to the 
MAC address of the load balancer and the destination MAC address to the uh, MAC address of the backend and generate a, um, a, scheduler, a scheduler, in this case a round robin, with three backends. In this case, the values of the map will be the MAC addresses. And finally, forward to the device uh, for which the ELB is going to communicate to the backend. Uh, for this case, um, as uh, in Ingress we don't have uh, connection information, we can't uh, load balancing, uh, do load balancing for uh, connection oriented um, uh, connections. So we could uh, achieve that just adding a, a J hash. Uh, we could um, use the concatenation uh, of the source address, client source address, and source port. Uh, these two values or registers are going to be uh, concatenated and then generate a, a J hash. This hash uh, will permit uh, not only to create some kind of persistency for the connections, but also um, to do some uh, traffic sharing. Uh, here we, we have included the seed, but in future releases uh, will be optional. Uh, in these cases, I forgot that uh, in this topology, we have to include in the backend a uh, loopback interface, which will have the IP address of the load balancer. And here, um, we are going to present some benchmarks that we made in our lab environment. Uh, so we used a uh, kernel version uh, 480RC4 uh, branch uh, NF next with two clients and three backends and one um, load balancer, each matching with two cores of uh, 3.33 GHz each, uh, i5, uh, with um, two threads per core, four gigabytes, two Intel NICs per machine, uh, some system tuning considerations from the Joseph uh, paper, uh, we are going to test the HTTP protocol. Uh, we have test both uh, IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, in this test, the LV never was uh, saturated uh, and the testing was uh, along three, uh, 30 seconds. And we have uh, also per, uh, do some um, uh, testing with LVS uh, in order to know in which state are these uh, implementations. So um, here we have that, uh, for example, in NAT uh, topologies, we have uh, performed for NFT, SNAT and DNAT topologies. Uh, with LV, LVS only, it's available as NAT, so it's um, uh, it, it will be um, recommended to compare the is NAT mode of both. Uh, it seems that uh, it's not much more performance that we expected, but uh, we could um, we could see that with NFT the the CPU is uh, slightly lower, but the request per second is also slightly lower than LVS in uh, SNAP topology. In DSR, um, DSR per return, uh, we, call, we could guess, uh, get um, that uh, NFT uh, is almost 0.554% uh, uh, of CPU. Meanwhile, uh, LVS is almost 5% um, of CPU. So if uh, LVS uh, reach, reaches the same amount of requests per second, we could get uh, almost 10 uh, times faster with uh, ingress with NF tables 
than there is a relation with LVS. In IPv6, in general, the request per seconds uh, are higher, and uh, the NAT uh, topology is quite similar between them, as same as uh, in IPv4. Uh, in DSR, uh, we could get uh, NFT uh, much more uh, performance than LVS, and it's almost uh, six times faster than, than LVS. And uh, well, just for finishing, uh, some work to do. Uh, we are going to work uh, in a lightweight NAT uh, from the hook ingress to improve the, the NAT results compared to LVS. Um, the user space NFT rules manager uh, which, uh, will be uh, allowed to set some more complex algorithms uh, not only round robin or weight schedulers, and also to manage the different topology easily. And finally, a health monitor that could be um, the possibility to include some layer support, so we could check at different layers, the health checks of the backends, and some internal and external uh, monitors. So the, the machine who is performing load balancing doesn't need to have the health checker. Okay, so this is the final talk. Uh, I want to thank you for the Orichi program for supporting this uh, development and for sure to Pablo who has been my mentor during this uh, development. Thank you. Okay, if you have any questions for Laura. Any question? Yeah. Thank you. Have you, have you looked into um, supporting consistent hashing? With? Consistent hashing? No. So now we are going to follow up with Florian that is going to make a quick update on on the FIP expression he is currently working on. Anyone get this full screen? Thanks. Yes, thank you. So I will talk a bit about the um, ongoing work on the FIP expression to allow querying the routing tables from NF tables. So the motivation is basically to um, implement two features that IP tables, respectively IP6 tables has. One is reverse pass filtering to check if a reply to a packet would leave via the same interface the packet arrived on. We have such a native um, 
interface for RP filtering for IPv4, but we do not have it in the stack for IPv6. So the, um, the only way to do this currently is using the IP6 tables for RP filter match. And the other feature that we would like to support in ftables is the address type matching, which basically means that um, you can ask the kernel if what it thinks about the source address or the destination address in the packet, if it's a local address, if it is, is a broadcast address, multicast address, and so on and so on. This can, for instance, be used to um, turn the curl from a weak end into a strong end model to only accept a packet for an IP address that is configured on the same interface, for instance. And because both of these um, IP tables matches partially overlap in features, it makes sense to implement that in one go in um, NF tables, and that's the uh, FIP expression. Um, so currently the syntax is basically um, to ask for FIP, and then you specify as a tu in the tuple syntax no uh, notation the um, inputs that you want to push, uh, put into the flowy structure to perform the lookup, and then you ask um, for, the desired, for the desired part of the resulting output. And the only thing that is currently implemented is the OIF interface, so that um, NF tables would place the, would ask the kernel um, or the routing table, and then it would place the output interface that the kernel thinks the packet will be sent out via into a register. But we could easily implement, for instance, an output interface name or the routing gateway or whatever <coughs> other things we want. Um, in the future, we will also, as I already said, um, implement um, the type of the address, for instance, broadcast, multicast, and so on. Um, so what you can do, for instance, you can ask, um, just do a lookup on the source address and give me the output interface, or you can combine it with the packet mark to, to also um, consider policy routing tables and so on. The only problem currently is that in the IP tables match, um, there is an invert option where you can, in a single rule, automatically discard any packets that do not pass the reverse, fast, reverse pass test. But the problem is that um, in NF tables, we do not have these kind of negation operations at all, because the NF tables expressions are um, supposed to be much more generic. Um, so we need some way to, um, to implement that, or it would be nice to implement that. Um, so what we would actually need is um, to ask for a comparison, um, is it not the input interface? And to do that, what, we or what I'm currently doing is I'm using zero as an invalid result. So what you can actually do, you can, you can um, ask if the output interface is equal to zero. And if it's equal to zero, that basically means the kernel has no idea and can't um, fulfill your request and can't figure out the proper um, interface. Um, this already works. Pablo has a different um, suggestion to, to um, um, add a, a found keyword and a not found keyword. Um, the idea here is that um, we need similar Boolean tests for some other things. For instance, um, if you want to figure out um, whether a packet has an extension header, for instance, a route ext an IPv6 uh, routing extension header, that's currently also not possible and we need some solution for that. So that would make sense to, to reuse that. I will have a look at this. Pablo sent me some patches, but I have to look at it. And, um, so um, another idea that we had what, uh, was um, to, um, to add explicit casting, because right now what, what will happen if you ask, for, for instance, for, for um, interface and then the NF tables tool will expect, expect uh, type compatible expression on the right hand side of the of the equals operator so if you ask for instance for zero then it will tell you that zero is not an interface name because it would expect something like eth zero or lo or whatever um, so what we debated in the past is whether we would add um, explicit casting so you can override these type checks but it, um, from the current discussions it seems that it's deemed too ugly and it would just blow the syntax so we will probably opt for implicit um, conversions when the types are compatible. So, so the current status is basically everything is done except the IPv6 part, the, which currently only compiles. I have not yet had time to properly check it. And uh, <laughs> the only thing that is currently supported is to get the output interface. 
I will also implement the output interface name, and once that once both is done, I will send that to Pablo, and after that, I will work on the address type matching to support the address type match in NF tables. So, any questions? No? Good. Pablo? Okay, thanks. Same presentation here. Oh yes, it's here. Okay. Fuck. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to use this. Okay, so um, um, let's describe a bit of the, uh, a bit the, the updates that have happened on, on the net filter tree since the last net dev conference. So basically, um, we now have a uh, pair net namespace hooks. This has been something that we've been discussing for a while. Basically, what we are trying to achieve is to improve integration of net filter with containers. So now what is going on is that um, in IP tables, instead of register, registering um, IP tables, uh, from IP tables, all hooks by default in every container, we we only register the hooks that we need. The, the approach that is being followed is since IP tables doesn't have a mechanism to ex explicitly register um, the the hooks that we need, contrary to uh, NF tables where we explicitly indicate what hooks we need. The approach that has been followed is to, um, as soon as we uh, list the rule set for the first time, the hooks are registered in that, in that name space. Um, so basically the idea is not to have any impact on in performance if, if IP tables is not, is, is not usable, which is, that has been a, a common complaint from, from users that performance has been decreasing with no use case without having any use case for IP tables. So next thing is um, the unprivileged net namespace push the X table infrastructure out of the um, cabinet I mean fence. So since then, um, then we discovered that basically um, um, that code was not properly reviewed to ensure that all the blobs that we are receiving from user space with the, with the rules of configuration were pro probably probably sanitized. So we discovered quite a few bugs there. Um, hopefully, we got patches already done. They, they have been they have been backport, they have been backported to the stable. And actually, there are some people still popping up with bugs that has been already resolved, which is good. So it seems so far we found, we have found all the problems that that were there. Um, another problem um, um, that, that is also related with the namespaces is the fact that the hash table that we were using um, in contract was uh, per net namespace. Now we have one single hash table for all net namespaces. Um, and this was causing also problems because uh, the hash table, when it's large enough, it uses the malloc and we can basically um, use all the physical memory of the system, which is not good at all. Another change is the alignment of uh, the NF contract structure to, to catch line, just following the same approach as the ASK buff. Um, uh, the ASK buff catch, the ASK buff structure. And, and Florian also converted that hash table to, to, to use the generic uh, resizable hash table implementations that we have already in the kernel. And so before that, we, we, we were having a known, a known hash table. Uh, uh, we have in NF, in NF contract, in, we have extensions that allows us to place 
things that are not um, that are not usually used. But uh, we found that a long time some of these fields were quite quite used, quite referenced, specifically the zones um, um, were part of uh, a contract extensions. And now we were, we 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 are we are including the. Um, for for quite some time, for some little time, we, we are we've been including the zones on the on the hashing. So we this the zone and all the fields have been moved away from the extensions. So now on the extensions area, we only have um, we only have what, what is really used. We removed the IP IP contract CCTL comp, uh, compat mode. All these proc interfaces are now gone. It's been 10 years since they've been around. So we we don't have three interfaces to use the space anymore. We only have two. Probably someday we can get rid of NF contract CCTL and just rely on the Netlink interface. So I mean 10 years, I guess it's enough. So and and Florian also got rid of Timers. This basically the approach. We don't we don't we don't use a timer uh, structure anymore in in NF contract. Instead, um, instead we we have a work queue and it's basically sweeping over the stale NF contract objects and getting rid of them. So um, so we, we reduce basically reduce on um, the the memory size of of the NF contract objects. Um, the helper assignment was has been enabled by default for a while, although this thing has been causing security problems. Eric LeBlanc already wrote an article about this. I've been, but because because this has been the default behavior since the beginning, we have to keep it around for a while. Uh, not recommending to 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 use it. So um, now it's finally disabled. You can still you still have a chance not to avoid breaking your um, setup by by enabling it via CCDL, but there is enough documentation about it, and we are still encouraging users not to not to use this anymore. And the hash limit uh, extension also uh, got improved by uh, supporting 64 bits uh, packet per second resolution, and on the NF table side, what we got is native NFQ support. Through the bridge family, um, so far, so far the, the NF the NFQ support was coming through from the bridge net filter, the BR net filter infrastructure that is known to, to be causing lots of problems and not working except exactly in the way that users are are expecting. So um, this is basically another step to to deprecate bridge net filter. And quite a lot of updates on the set infrastructure. Now we are supporting adjacent range in the set representation. We need still some, a bit of code on in user space to um, to basically merge this adjacent range while while updating. So basically, if we have to to so what it happens at this point uh, at this moment is that we keep both uh, both adjacent range ranges in the in the kernel. But it should be very easy to implement from user space with the logic that we already have in kernel space. It should be very possible just to to remove the outer and the inner of the two adjacent ranges, so, so we just leave in the kernel one single range. So another thing is is the add create semantics for elements. Um, basically, um, users were complaining about the fact that. Um, about the fact that um, it was not very handy, the fact the, 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 uh, that adding a new element would cause um, a exist error. So what we have now is that add, if you use NFC add element, and the element exists already, it's not going to complain. And if you use create, it's going to say the element exists. So depending on what you need, you use one command, command of another. What else? Um, we have support for deletion of inactive elements, which may sound a bit um, crazy, but basically we are aiming to to have better support for robots. Robots they can 
put several rule updates in a single batch, and in that single update, you may get introduce this element and then delete it. So what, what is going on now is that just basically the kernel is going to notice that you added an element that is going to be deleted and just invalidate the whole thing so the, the element doesn't show up. What else we have? Um, we have a new command for to flush set elements of a set. Um, I have this, this, I have to submit patches, but they are already ready. So we have a flush command as, as we have for tables, we have for chains, and we have for, we are now, 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 now going to have it for sets, um, inverted lookups, and inverted dynamic set element insertions. The inverted lookups is basically just matching if an element is not in a set, and for dynamic set, set, set element insert, insertion, so basically this expression allows us to introduce elements in sets um, from the packet path. And the, the idea is to use this because, because the flow table of generic infrastructure that we have depends on this dynamic uh, sets. We can, if we specify a, a size for that table, we can we can catch when 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 filling that 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 flow table that that is actually represented by a set, it's it's full. So we can we can catch the overflow scenario and decide what to do with the packet that is not actually fitting into the flow table. Okay, so um, the cat the two new expressions that Laura has has just explained. And we have another two, just range and quota, basically with the semantics that we have for rule. Uh, to express our rule set, that is basically every every rule is composed of expressions, and those expressions are evaluated in an and 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 fashion, and then every rule is or 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 or. So with this semantics, uh, we cannot express inverted range. So we need a, a specific range range expression, which is the, the easiest way to to make it. And the quota is basically allowing to define quotas for um, for packets, but also based on on connection tracking. Information currently all the packet information is all the, all the packet all the base it is all based on packet information, but it should be possible to to extend it to to relay on the contract information. So this quota expression can be plugged into the um, into flow table, so we can basically populate uh, based on packets. We can populate the flow table with new entries and define a, a specific quota for the for every new element that is introduced in the flow, in the flow table. Call label support, that was missing. And an NFQ integration with maps that was also lacking. So we fully explored the, um, the infrastructure available, available in, in NF tables. So uh, NFQ originally was implemented in a way that basically makes it work exactly in the same way that, that IP tables operate. So you need one rule per configuration. Now you can use maps, and using maps means that with one single rule you can decide to what queue you want to send the packet. So that's very important to exploit the, the map infrastructure. So we basically reduce many, many lots of fixes. We've been also visiting the, the NF hooks. People say NF hooks are slow, so we are going to get this faster. So um, the first step in the conversion is the double link list has been replaced by a single link list. And the next step that is ongoing, and, and that we, we expect to, to make it land in, in the tree soon, is the conversion to ARI. The ARI will help us to exploit a bit better the catch locality. So basically, we expect to find four hooks in the catch line. So should speed up things, hopefully. We would like to deprecate the NF stop. It's not exactly equivalent to NF accept. I've been discussing with Florian. It, this is only used by the bridge, by the BR net filter infrastructure. That is um, something that is, as I said, that is causing lots of problems and it got lots of design mistakes in it. So we are just going to get that NF stop out of the core at the cost of adding a bit more code to the BR net filter thing. So that is the only one using using it. So um, another thing is to get NFQ out of out of, out of the, the the core path. So basically, the idea is to to get the NFQ handling place it place it in a new NF NFQ function, and that NFQ function is going to be invoked from 
from XT NFQ or from NFT Q. So in the end, after after these changes, what we have what we, what we have in the tree is just handling from three verdicts. So that basically accept, drop, and stolen. Stolen is just to say that um, the kernel module or a user space application has taken the packet and not didn't return it. So it's just defining the escape path. So just very little verdicts to handle and actually very simple actions to apply on them. And given that after that any focus law is going to become very small, we can we can inline it. Other fronts. So all the things that we are looking into are as uh, are the switch off laws. We have a couple of hardware that has land on our on our hands. Basically a Marvel ATA E6 XXX um, chip. It it provides 255 rule entries in a TCAM. It's rule based. It provides matches. Um, basically, you can match everything in the frame up to 47 bytes, and it got actions. And the Qualcomm is a bit is a bit is different. Actually. Um, it's, it, it, it got a flow table and this needs to be populated from the packet path. So um, the patches that we receive from the Apple and WRT people or leader basically are offloading, are using the contract infrastructure to, to, to populate the table. But this is, this is actually quite far from the contract semantics. Contract is doing lots of things. So this is matching way better with the flow table definition that we have in NF tables. So basically the idea is to, um, to uh, for these chips, is just to define um, a rule with a, with a flow table definition that's going to show up since the beginning, already config configure. It will, be, it will be kind of a pre-configuration and, and then you can use the, the standard facilities to the standard commands in NF tables just to list the content of the flow table or flash it or whatever you need. The MPA of load should be easy. I mean, with, with infrastructure for switch off load, it should be also very easy. It will be a matter just to, um, based on the NFT representation, native representation, just um, emit the um, the MPU instructions that need to happen. I've been looking at, at, at the um, patch that Netronov has submitted to do this for BPF, and I, I would expect that the driver for NFT would be much more simple. Um, and another thing that, that um, it's um, got a very simple proof of concept, just basically to get some numbers. Um, it's a JID using BPF. Basically, the idea would be just to take the, uh, as, as in with the NPU, just take the the NFT representation and, and generate generate BPFI code. This comes with many many good things, as just reducing complexity quite a lot. So we actually don't need to invoke the BPF verifier. The NFT tables front end will basically verify already that uh, no crazy things happens, no loops, no no illegal stuff, and. The BPF code gener by code generation will, will happen from from the kernel itself, and um, that's basically the idea. So just to finish, there are lots of ongoing discussions on, about on programmability in this conference. So let's try to summarize a bit the NFT way or the NFT approach for this problem. So in NFT we have a network specific VM. It's very simple by code verification. We don't even pass pointers between our expressions that are our, our instructions. We have very little instruction, ne instructions, network specific. We have we can address register at 32, 128. Just um, um, provide an link interface that is a very common interface that we we have already for other networking subsystem. So the stack data path is unflexible, so let's try to reuse the components that we have in the kernel. And if tables is in the kernel. Um, so what we can do is, as Florian exposed, we, we, are now, we are now going to have a FIP expression. We could use this FIP, FIP expression from ingress. So we can just define our 
take a path of, uh, we can remove layers, but in case that, for example, we want to just look up uh, on, on FIB and then decide on what interface to put the packet, just make the rule to, to, to achieve this. Similar thing could be done with um, a socket expression. So we basically look up for the socket and define some, some fat path to deliver the packet. I mean, same idea would apply to all existing components. So the good thing about raising the existing components in kernel is that um, applications can still use the existing netlink interfaces to configure them. So potentially all existing applications will not need to be rewritten to, to, um, to integrate with this approach. So um, then we just plug these NFT instructions, expressions, we, we use the term to refer to this. So just plug these, these instructions just to define the data path in the way you want. And, and the way to express all this will be rule-based syntax that combined with the map infrastructure that we have um, results in no linear rules at inspection anymore. Basically, um, we can just, um, we, we, we will represent the, the, um, the rule set in a tree fashion with maps uh, that will point to the next, in case we, we have to perform an, an ex, another lookup. So with very little lookups, we, we find what we have to do with the packet. So that's basically it. So in case you have any question. Hello, I've been asked if there is some work plan on uh, the policy keyword we have in IP table for IPsec. I think it is still missing. Yes, this is missing. Actually, I've been talking to Stephen um, this is something we would like to... Uh, Florian, you, you've been having a look into this. Would you like to talk? Yes. Um, so, the reality is that most people actually don't really use the policy match. They just ask for, was this packet ever subject to IPsec processing? And they don't... Most people don't use all these options where you can match for specific policies. So one idea was to just add, um, to extend the meta expression to ask, is there a sec pass assigned to the packet? That would be a six line kernel patch or something like that. And that's probably what we will do. And then um, if someone comes along and really has a use case where you need to, to match specific policies, then add it later. I uh, wonder what your uh, opinions are about uh, NAT46 and NAT64 versus yeah. NF tables. Yeah, this is something on our radar. And I have to say that I have a patch for that, it's not even a proof of concept, but it's, I mean, I've been receiving implementations from other people um, that were very ugly indeed. Uh, there are quite many of them on the internet also that use a space implementation using, using TAP. But it's something that we, we would like to we would like to have. It shouldn't be very hard to 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 make this fit into the infrastructure that we have. We only need just to be a bit careful in with contract. We are going to have tuples that are going to basically um, store information about IP4, IP6, IP6, IP4, depending on on the direction of the packets, and then. Uh, many, many, many things uh, like mapping SCMP. It, this is a stuff that many, many other people have worked on already, so we can already have a look at what they did and just do it. So, not sure. Do you have patches, matcha? Um, not, not based on NF tables. I've been taking a look at making a device um, to, to basically do the NAT, but I'm wondering, you know, if eBPF or some sort of integration with NF tables or IP tables or something would be a better match. We are going to have it, so sooner or later. So if we did a test. So we did implementation um, in eBPF, and but I mean it doesn't support all the things, but like the basic stuff is working. Um, and we use it for con for containers, like when they have only IPv4 support, and we can translate that. So, um, but yeah. Just as an example.
I, I guess we should get some consensus at some point about what is the right way to do this. Um, the NAT, NAT, NAT 64, you mean? We have the infrastructure to make it. I mean, I, I see no reason to. Do you, can you see any reason to that prevents not introducing this in NetFilter? Yeah, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. So. So I think I looked at that a long, long, long time ago, and maybe I didn't even look at the right place, but it seems like the, the hooks are fundamentally not, like they, they fundamentally weren't willing to turn a packet from one run proto into a different proto. Uh, but perhaps I misread it, right? Because obviously you have this IPv4 packet coming in, and then at some point in the net filter hook, it turns into an IPv6 packet, and you're kind of like you're in the wrong address family and so on. So I don't know if that's, is that now easy to do? So you, what you're referring explicitly to, to the NAT64 problem? Uh, NAT46. NAT46? Potentially, yes. I didn't really spend on time on that, but, but I, I, as I said, I, I have received patches that are a bit of a hack, and I'm using the, the NF hook infrastructure to make it, so. I will look into that, and I'll have a strong opinion on it, but at this point. But anyway, I mean, if it, if it become unfeasible, you you will be the first to know, right? So <laughs> it's not that we are going to push a hack into the kernel. No way. So, if there are any any other question? Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we will have a bit more time of break, right? Good, thank you. So the cookie is already available.